Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I could probably eat 26 Jaffa Cakes in a row. And I'm Gary, and today we're going to review and discuss The Relic, which released in 1997. Based on the novel by Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child, with a screenplay by Amy Holden Jones, John Raffo, Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver, and directed by Peter Hyams. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Tom Sizemore character, Lieutenant Vincent D'Augusta, who is a Chicago police officer investigating a spate of murders in the city. His investigation takes him to the local museum where he hooks up with Penelope Ann Miller's character, Margot Green, and the two of them start to investigate the murders together. But as the investigation deepens, they realise that not only are they dealing with a monster, but that the monster may actually be part human. Join your mochas, gentlemen. Smell. Take it outside, Martini. Okay. So I've been a big fan of this movie since its first release. I managed to catch it sort of early 2000s on yeah. the rental. I was very surprised by this film. And it's one of those films I always ask people, like, you like monster movies? Have you ever seen the Relic. Yeah. I didn't actually realise it was based on a novel. No, neither did I. And then I, come yeah. to discover that there's a whole series of novels that did not get movie adaptations. Oh. Well, this film also didn't even have the main character from those books in this film. So, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, the D'Augusta character, I think, was a hybrid of the Pendergrast character from the books. Yeah. Could have merged together to make this character, but... Uh, like a chimera. Oh, like a chimera. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this film, it did okay. It had like a $60 million budget and it made about $30 million on its opening weekend. Nice. So it didn't really earn all of its money back overnight. But apparently Peter Hames was told, you know, the projections from the studio was that this film was going to do badly. Yeah. But he actually got a phone call saying, oh, we're surprised the film's doing five times better than we thought it would. <laughs> Maybe it was because they reshot the ending or did an extra ending, which was needed to give the film a little send off at the end. Yeah. yeah. Just if you've never seen this film before, you imagine, well, if you've seen a monster movie before, you know how usually they defeat the beast. And yeah. And imagine what they had to do for this one. Uh, but yeah, big fan of this film. I mix this one up with The Mimic as well. A like, lot of people do. Late 90s, like 1999, I remember seeing The Relic. I remember seeing, I always call it The Mimic, but it is just Mimic. And it was just that time where it was a, you know, crazy monster features were going on. You know, you had your deep rising and you had your Mimic and you, and you had your Relic. And i got to give a shout out to Tom Sizemore. I'm a bit of a fan. Saving Private Ryan... Black Hawk Down, True Romance, and then this, where he actually gets the lead. Oh, I also forgot Heat as well. He's a badass in Heat. Yes, yep. You know, but this comes along, and then he's the lead investigative detective, you know, trying to work it out. And he's actually got, like, some depth to his character as well. Well, I should think so, with the film having four writers and also being based <laughs> on a book. Like... Well, that is actually one of my problems with the film is that I felt like it was a bit overwritten. That, like, yeah. We get introduced to uh, to D'Augusta's character and like straight off the bat we find out that he's going through a divorce, that he's lost custody of a dog and it becomes a recurring joke throughout the film that everywhere he goes, like everyone knows about <laughs> yeah. his current marital status and the ownership of his dog issues. So I was like, okay... But then again, I say it feels overwritten. It's kind of good that we have a character that is established quickly. Yeah. That that makes him likable. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, we've got that opening sequence where we have John Whitney, who is like an explorer. We, we're he's not an anthropologist. In, yeah, we're not entirely sure where he is. He's in he's, Brazil. Well, we're not entirely sure where he is at this point. We get told where he is, but here he is in the dark with these villagers. There's this kind of strange ritual going on. You know, they're, they're, they're going through something with these leaves and then they kind of give him this cup of liquid and he's just like, okay, yeah, I'll drink <laughs> it. I'm like... That's a really bad plan, man. Right? Well, maybe, yeah, uh, I mean, he starts hallucinating, so it must have been some good stuff, because he's just like, Kahluga! Yeah. Or Kathoga? Kathoga, that's Kathoga, what that's, that's it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and we, we, we've, we find out that this, this village that he visits, this Kathoga is like uh, the monster born from Satan, or, you know, Satan's pet beast or something, and they they worship this creature. And so he wanted to 
get as much information as he could to send it back to the Chicago Museum that he works at so that they can put on this big expedition. Um, but then as he gets the stuff sent to the ship, he then rushes to the ship and he starts kind of demanding that the captain removes his boxes. He doesn't explain why, but they just can't go to America. And so the captain's like, oh, but they're, if they're on board. They're already saved. Don't worry about it. And so Whitney kind of sneaks on board looking for his boxes and then realizes that actually he's come across the wrong boxes and his are still on the dock. It's a great shot, isn't it? Where you see the boat <laughs> taking off and you just see the boxes there. It cuts back to him. No! no! <laughs> yeah. Now, interestingly, uh, the, the the book is also set at the uh, the New York uh, Museum. Yeah, yeah. And they wanted to film there as well. Yeah. But the museum turned around and went, you want to make a monster movie, a horror movie, a R-rated, 18-rated, gory monster movie in our museum? No. no. <laughs> so, like, uh, any, anyone else? Chicago, like, yeah, yeah pick, we'll pick do us. <laughs> so now we end up in Chicago, which I don't know, it still works. Like, yes. I have to say, the museum in this film is one of the stars of the of the film. Totally, uh, it creates the atmosphere. It gives that spooky sense of wonder. You don't know what's in there, yeah. yet alone what actually is in there and so i just think it's a it's a really really cool setting you don't see yeah. that often in in horror movies yeah especially the fact that like once the museum shuts down you know and it's nighttime it does get spooky you know you've got all these artifacts you've got all these art pieces going on but then you've just got like the random guards kind of going along so it really sets the shadowy darkness the pace of it the thing is, you don't see the creature for an incredibly long time. Well, no, well, the film cuts six weeks later as well, doesn't it? As the, uh, well, the vessel turns up in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. And DeGusta's called to it because it's a crime scene because it's a bit of a ghost ship. Yeah. Everyone on board is dead. Now, I've got just a little bit of an issue with this, is that... So they go on board and they realise that there's nobody there, but there's blood and and... You know, Vincent D'Augusta, he, he's he's very superstitious, so he's making sure that he's avoiding all these things that will bring him bad luck. And then him and his buddy are just like, huh, what's that smell? It smells really bad. Let's lift up this hatch and realize that underneath the hatch in this little water bilge are all the body parts of all the crew that they've been looking for. Now, were they killed like... <laughs> by the monster and then the monster kind of just scooped the parts into the floor and then closed the lid to go oh i really hope nobody finds these parts well yeah i mean I, th th there's a whole slew of questions here i have now <laughs> yeah. did he kill all of these like it's six weeks later did he kill them five weeks ago four weeks ago did he kill them that morning <laughs> how, how when, when did he kill the guy piloting the boat how did it dock without crashing? How did it get where it was going? Man, it's lost where Jurassic monster? Park all over again, isn't <laughs> right? it? Yeah. So I've got all these questions. I'm like, and on top of that, where is the monster? Where did it go? Yeah. Because, well, we'll find out. It got at the museum. And I'm like, well, how did it get there without being <laughs> spotted? How did it know to go there? Well, this we find out later there's some sub subterranean tunnels yeah. that where the boat was for a little bit just before it got caught. That's possibly where... The creature might have got off but a week later after that so we're now looking at seven weeks we then get to the museum and that's when we're introduced to Pen penelope ann miller's character margot green who is uh she well she's not another anthropologist she's no. a evolutionary kind of expert and she likes to obviously study where animals evolve and the history of them and all this kind of stuff um, but she's she's kind of on edge at the moment because she's attempting to try to get a, a really expensive grant from some you know investors to keep her crew going. And you've got uh, Chi Mu Lo who plays Greg Lee, who is also trying to sneak the grant from behind her. Now, what I think is incredibly funny, and I only read this up when I was wiki in the film, that Greg and Margot have worked together before, but in a school. Okay. Because it turns was out... Was it the one where uh, there was a cop pretending to be a teacher? Yes, there it is. Was, yeah, it was a kindergarten cop. <laughs> because we've also got Linda Hunt uh, playing Anne Cuthbert, who is a great actress, and she's like the custodian or the, the overall boss for the museum. And she herself worked with <laughs> Penelope Ann Miller and Greg Lee's actor in Kindergarten Cop. And so you're just like... Oh, so teaching didn't work out for you then, did it? No. <laughs> <laughs>
where we also find James Whitmore. Uh, so we find out that, I guess, life after Shawshank wasn't too bad on him <laughs> yeah, after all. No. He <laughs> pretended to hang himself, but no, he's now working for the museum. And, and they are investigating the fact that they haven't heard from John Whitney for seven to eight weeks at this moment. They knew he'd gone down to somewhere in Brazil and that he was going to talk to the, or speak to these villagers and he was going to supposedly send back these Cathoga kind of monuments. But instead, all they've ended up with are these boxes that are filled with packing leaves with these strange little orange kind of things on them, on the leaves. Now, you're not entirely sure what they are at first, but as Margot's character starts to kind of uh, experiment on them or investigate them, she realizes that they're they're like a weird steroid. It's like a fungus. Like a yeah. fungus thing that once ingested by certain creatures, they will mutate. And you do see like a little bug kind of sneak into the box. And then later on, you see this bug come out and it's fucking humongous. <laughs> I mean, you've just mentioned that moment. I don't know whether it was just me, but the sound effect of that bug, that that beetle emerging, yeah. it sounded like a xenomorph. <laughs> yeah, it did. And I was like, well, we've got Stan Winston involved, we've got yes. Galan Hurd involved. And there's many a moments throughout this film that I'm like, that reminds me of Jurassic Park. That reminds me of Aliens. <laughs> and it kept happening, like, so much so that I, I was not surprised to find out that a lot of people went, this is Jurassic Park meets Aliens in a museum. And I'm like, yeah, you, we're all right. We are all right. We're all on the same wavelength. It's great. Uh, but uh, that's to be said, the first sort of hour and a half of this film, kind of, well, first hour, yeah. it feels like a detective movie. <laughs> yeah, it does. Because we are following Degusta, who's now turned up at the museum, uh, because the security guard, you might recognize this guy, also from said previous movie, Jurassic Park. Oh, really? I mean, this guy uh, was the guy who was, uh, I mean, he's taking a break in this film from shipping velociraptors around. Whoa, oh, really? He was he was the guy who dies right at the beginning. <laughs> But, I mean, he didn't die, clearly, and so he's now on a smoke break. <laughs> and he's smoking a little doobie, and, yes. well, you're in a horror movie, and, well, uh, it's not going to work out too well for you. No. Uh, we do find his severed head and his brain and blood all over the place, and... Man. I forgot how gory this movie is. It's pretty gory, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah. It's it's surprising to see a, like a big studio spend out on gore, and it's like, well, you know, it's going to look pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, when you see Stan Winston's name pop up in the opening credits, you can just relax, can't you? You just be like, at least there's going to be something good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've always loved obviously Stan Winston's work, and I think that's what kind of maybe pushes this movie just a few more elevations above your standard bog standard monster movie is that even though you don't get to see the creature a lot when you do get to see it particularly the practical prosthetic effects it's amazing you know some of the eye effects look really well some of the claw effects really well you kind of wish that you see some more of the monster in motion but if you have any experience with practical prosthetic effects it sometimes just can't do what you want it to do. So then you've got to kind of mix it up with some CGI. But as Gary said, the first hour is just following Tom Sizemore's character investigating these, these spate of murders because you get the security guard, he gets killed. And then you've got two kids that get lost in, in the museum after dark and they start hearing some strange noises. And so he's... He's wanting to shut the museum down because he's pretty certain that there's a mass murdering psychopath running around there cutting out people's brains and stealing bits. But Linda Hunt's character, Anne Cuthbert, is kind of like the mayor from Jaws where she's just like, no, no, we've got to keep the museum open. We've got these really rich people coming and we the need mayor's the mayor's coming. And so is his wife. <laughs> yeah. And so... Augusta is kind of like Brody's character, like, okay, fine, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do half and half. I'll make sure to check the offices and check the corridors, but then we're going to have to investigate, obviously, the tunnels and everything underneath to see if there's anybody hiding. There's... Yep. I was going to say, and we do catch up with two police officers that are wandering around. Yes. And uh, they end up just firing at this guy that just opens this tent flap. They just blow him away. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, it turns out that he, he is a convicted murderer and rapist and serial killer. And, oh, it's phew that we got him. Oh, 
So there's no more monster, it was just this homeless guy. Those two cops, I think, are really well written and developed in this movie. They, I don't even know their names. I mean, I'm sure I could have wikied them and, and found out who they are and the actors and, and all that kind of stuff. But the fact that we only briefly see them fight this kind of, you know, homeless man here. He's got an axe! <laughs> oh yeah, and and the, the 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 guy who's the head of the security for the museum is like, oh well, that must be the guy. Yeah, yeah, he's already dead. But then these two cops will turn up multiple times later on when all the major action takes off, and they're actually kind of pinnacle at one point. They're like, hey man, are you gonna stay behind? Yeah. Do you need some extra ammo? You take care of yourself. You take. And I'm like, oh, buddy, cop drama. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> that's how I feel about the film being overwritten <laughs> because it, it it's noticeable. It's it's not seamless. No, you no, know, it's yeah. No Noticeable though, so but it still works. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's what it's, like this film's weird charm about it. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's good. Now, always interesting because you mentioned Mimic earlier, and I remember you know re always reminded of Mimic with this film as well. And yeah. I was just like, now which one is it? Is it Mimic or the Relic where the two kids die? And I was like, watching Mimic. this one, watching this one, I was like, no, I'm pretty sure it's Relic where the two kids die. <laughs> and then you see them outside very briefly as yeah, the Justice yeah, walking yeah. in. I was like, oh no, they survived. And then they talk about what they saw in there. So I was like, so it must have been Mimic it's where the Mimic. kids died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Mimic, those things kill freaking everybody. In, in, in Relic, it turns out that the creature is attempting to eat people's uh, parts of people's brains. I think it's the oblum gata or par or <laughs> I don't know brain surgery, but it's it's a gland that kind of replicates like uh, uh, adrenaline or steroids or, or or something, and and it need the, the creature needs to eat that part of the brain to keep itself going or it will die. That's right. It sort of regulates its hormones by consuming, I think it's the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, part of the brain. yeah. Sorry. And, uh, and so, yeah, so they find this connection between all the severed heads on the barge. Yes. Now the security guard as well. And so they're trying to figure out what's doing this. And they're like, it probably wasn't that guy with the axe in the basement. <laughs> yeah. It probably wasn't him. And so Degust is trying to tell everyone, like, no, I think we've still got something down here. Yeah. But then he also gets the phone call from his chief as well. He's like, here's the mayor. And the mayor's like, oh, here, there, there's a girl. Or, there's a party at the museum tonight. Oh, it's really great that you'll be keeping everyone safe tonight. Yeah. Thanks, goodbye. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, well. <laughs> we know the mayor's going to pay for that one. I think it's good as well that, I mean, Penelope Ann Miller, I... I've seen her in a few things. I mean, nothing majorly massive. Kindergarten Cop. I kind of like her in The Shadow, you know, where she plays another character called Margot too. Um, but where it feels kind of like Tom Sizemore should be the hero who kind of works everything out. She's actually the science behind everything where he's literally just the brute force. And so at some point she kind of jockeys for for main lead as well because she starts to investigate you know the packing leaves that john whitney's had the uh sent to his office because his office gets absolutely trashed and they can't explain it why you know she starts to investigate these things on the leaves and that's where obviously she comes across the bug and has to kill it with a book and when she starts to do a kind of autopsy or or like a cut up of the bug she realizes that it's 33% reptile. And part gecko yeah, and yeah. part something else. And part something else. And so that's where she starts to uncover that the bug ingested these things off the leaf. And then that has kind of forced it to go through this kind of hybrid chimeric kind of mutation where it becomes something new. So then taking that into account, some of the, the investigation that they've, scene in concerning this creature that they're still not entirely sure because they still haven't nobody survived to see it in one and go oh yeah this is what it looks like most of the times they end up dead but she starts to uncover and she even gets a little bit of its blood and puts that into her machine and starts to uncover right it's got 33 percent gecko 33 percent insect it's got something else in there and it also may be partly human Oh, well, I mean, that's the big reveal at the yeah, very end yeah, of the movie yeah. uh, that uh, John Whitney uh, is the creature, which is yeah. so we know that something happened to him at the very beginning of the film. Yeah. Then we know, obviously, he's disappeared. So where has he gone? Well, 
you know, odds are he's probably the monster. <laughs> yeah. So we imagine he was on the barge, got to Chicago, then got to the museum, trashed his office looking for whatever was supposed to have been sent there, which well, was, you know, the, the package. So was he still human when he was on board the yeah, boat? It was, I, 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 I mean, this is this is where I'm like. There's a whole other film here. Yeah, you know, it's like it's like John Carpenter's The Thing and Cronenberg's The Fly. Yeah, yeah. You know, where he's undergoing this transformation. Yeah, and then he's still eating and feeding off the people on the barge as over this journey, and uh, so yeah, I imagine he was still mostly human, and then without getting the sustenance he needed, he you know he mutated transformed yeah. into this creature. And when the gala itself, I mean, because this is the big moment, the gala happens. And Greg's a bit of a dick and he, he explains to the security guys, oh yeah, no, that's fine. You can lock down different areas of the museum. We don't have to go there. Even though that that locks out Margot's and Albert's characters in a separate part of the museum. Well, you've got D'Augusta and his friend agent. They're sort of down in the sewers. Yeah. And they're down there with the guard dogs as well, the sniffer dogs yeah. trying to track down the thing. And well, one of the, one of the, um, the, the dogs go running uh, one of the dogs ends up being horribly mauled and then thrown back at them. Yeah. Which then sends one of the cops off on a, on a rage as he goes chasing for the creature. Yeah. And then Degussa eventually catches up uh, with the dog, where we also had this wonderful shot with the dog kind of just oh, cowering yeah. and whimpering as the beast is in front of it. Yeah. But Degussa eventually finds that dog. And there's a happy reunion there. It is. But... That uh, security guard, the police officer, his severed-headed remains gets dropped through the window oh, into yeah. the gala after we've had this blood dropping on this lady. Yeah. And all hell breaks loose. Five, six, seven, the whole board's going down. Twenty-seven. It says we're having an earthquake. Man, this bit at the end. I mean, it's really just surprising how well this part is done. Where all hell breaks loose. All of the rich people are just rushing out of the exhibit. They end up getting to the doors and smashing through the doors. Well, this is the bit in. that reminds me of Aliens, where you've got the two security guards are like, "How oh, they cut the power? I don't <laughs> yeah, know. You, yeah. you go and check the power." And he's looking at the monitors, and the <laughs> monitors go static, and then the Richie lights blink out. Yeah. Then it, or then they get the you know the red lights as well, yeah. and he wanders back into his room. He's like, "Hey, buddy, okay. oh god, your head's fallen off. <laughs> yeah, and How'd the, that happen?" The creature's just like, "I'm going to kill you now and take out all the." Well, so, but the lizard. creature was just in. The gala and now then it was in the sewers and then it's in there with them and i'm like wait a minute this creature is teleporting is there more than one of them <laughs> no it certainly feels like that it's just really really fast it could be part cheetah well it's definitely cheating because <laughs> it's, it's cheating. jumping all over the place <laughs> yeah. so I'm like, Where's... i mean it probably knows its way around the the museum it used to work here that is true <laughs> i mean how much of of john's mind is really in the creature but he's consumed by the addiction and desire to consume the brain. So yeah, and is he is he filled up with the fact that he has all this power now that he can seem he because he's pretty much invincible. Yeah, well, in the book it explains like it, the, his his skin is pretty much bulletproof. It's so thick that yeah. nothing can penetrate it. And uh, so yeah, it's literally adapted. Yeah, you know, it's part. I mean, we'll go into some of the specifics now. But it was uh, Mark McCreary who designed the creature. He penciled it. Yeah. And then it was the director who just went, "I like that design." That went to Stan Winston, who then built three of these. Uh, three of these. Uh, one was the sort of the hero one, the one for all the close-ups. That nice. looks good. Yeah, yeah. And two more were the uh, you know the stunt suits, the practical ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then one giant head as well for the close-ups. Nice. But this was one hell of a design. And it obviously was designed. It is a puppet suit. There is a dude in that suit. Oh, wow. Uh, and it was, just, I mean, granted, he had to be on a harness as well to help support him. Yeah. Like, there was all sorts of arms and extensions inside. But, you know, um, McCreary, who designed it, has gone on to say, like, the people that had to wear it and were in there said it was the worst experience of their lives. Really? And he said he's taken those painful lessons of creature design, along with Stan Winston going forward to make sure they don't ever inflict that kind of pain on actors that have to wear monster suits ever again. I mean, did he not watch Invaders from Mars and see what the fuck they did with those <laughs> goddamn suits? Right. <laughs> uh, but the, the design itself is spectacular. And it's, it's different, again, from the book. But it's kind of got an alligator's body or scales mixed with that of a horse or yeah, a lion. Yeah, a lion, yeah. Uh, it's, and it's got mandibles That's on right. The front I, I as think well. the front head looks more like a spider. Yeah, it looks like, it's got multiple yeah, eyes. That's right. And so it just looks 
intimidating and frightening. Uh, however, the reason why we're seeing it so late in the movie it was mm. because, for the most part, it wasn't quite ready yet. <laughs> Yeah. They had to keep waiting. The re- I mean, the film was due out in 1996. Wow. But it got delayed till 97 because, well, they were running behind on the monster. Nice. But when you do get to see it, mostly it's in shadows. But during this sequence where it terrorizes these people, it's ripping this guy's head off. Yeah. You know, the SWAT team the coming SWAT in. SWAT team. Oh, man. <laughs> that one guy gets pinned down. He's being decapitated. <laughs> yeah. I love the shot where it jumps off the guy on the rope and lands yes. with him. And then you've got the last guy dangling there going, pull me up. <laughs> pull me up. And then they pull him up and they realize he's got no legs. Ah! Help me. Help. 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 And well, I wonder why it got easier all of a sudden. I mean, I, I question at that point why the creature didn't try to just escape and run havoc. You know, if it needs to eat all these people's oblongatas or brain bars or hypothalamuses, you know, it, it could just run right around the city if it's pretty much invincible. But with with the lack of, you know, practical effect magic on screen, you know, they needed to contain it in these little few action sequences. And so at the same time, while the creature is running around ripping apart the SWAT team and killing Greg and trying to attack the mayor, the Gusto has, has worked his way f- back through the museum, come across Margot uh, uh, and Albert Frock, and and he sent his partner off, hasn't he? He's told his partner to go. You need- He's evacuating those from the main event yeah. down through the sewers while the others stayed there and well, got killed. That's it. You need to get them down into the sewers. There's, there's a flooded area, but you should be able to walk through, get up over the other side because the museum as well has gone into a massive huge security lockdown. So the cops outside are trying to cut their way through. Um, and, and Albert Frock kind of um, realizes he can't go very far because he's in a wheelchair. And so he asks Margot to just leave him in this one area while she goes off to help to Gusto try to defeat the creature. And then the creature actually turns up and there's this moment where Frock is looking at the creature and there's kind of like a bit of a recognition. Yeah. You know, like the, like the creature knows him. May, it may not fully remember from where, but it certainly just has a look with him. And then later on, we come back, the whole cage is being ripped apart and he's fucking dead. Uh, you got a feel for Penelope Ann Miller's character twice in this movie. She just happens to inadvertently walk upon a dead person's corpse <laughs> right. and freak her goddamn head off. Well, how did she manage to walk into that first crime scene now? There was like 10 cops outside. I know. They just let her through. And the thing is, she even says, well, later on, you, it'd be better if you just close the door. I'm like, it's a men's bathroom. Well, did you not think about <laughs> not going in there? Where is his head? It's over there by the sink. Lieutenant Augustus. Oh, my God! Oh, no, no, no. Get her out of here. Don't look. No, no, no. The uh, partner starts to take the uh, last few survivors down into the basement, and as they're going around, I like, like the water is like waist high. Yeah. And so the creature is able to submerge itself in this water and then kill one of the cops and a, a woman. Yeah. As well, and. While it's it, even the partner, Degusto's partner, is just like, look, while it's eating them, let's, let's go. Let's <laughs> go. Yeah. And also, I mean, sadly, uh, we also lose Greg Lee, who goes sadly. Uh, wandering off sadly. I mean, yeah, he was it's set up as an antagonist, you know, he was the sleazy guy who yeah. wants all of the all of the, the funding so he can have all of his projects, doesn't care about no. anybody else. But yeah. Apparently, I mean, he also survives in the books, he carries on, as well as um, uh, Dr. Albert Frock, he also survives uh, oh. in the novel as well. I mean, they but, needed to up the body count for the movie. It's true, it's true, yeah, yeah. So Margot comes up with the idea, based on some of the research that she's done about the creature's DNA, that it'll probably be susceptible to the cold. Yes. So she comes up with a plan to track it down and then freeze it. And it doesn't really work. No, it does <laughs> So then she decides that, after some more research, that it's probably going to be after the fungus that was on the leaf. So yeah. they sort of bait it and trap it, try, or try to anyway. And uh, But the creature is a little bit smarter than that. Yeah, it doesn't fall for that trick either. No, it doesn't, no. 
And so it chases Margot into her like work area. That's just been sealed off because yeah. Augusta was trying to keep her safe. And now he's basically locked himself out. But I also love the fact that there was a part at the beginning where, where she was walking to Augusta around her area, you know, and sh showing her what they do in, in this part of the museum. And he's looking at this one area and he's like, oh, this is a whole lot of flammable equipment here. And she's like, oh, yeah. And he's like, better not light a match. And I'm like, foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, <you know? laughs> and so then when when he's been locked out, when D'Augusto has been locked away from Margo, Margo now kind of takes upon the, the, the Ripley. The final girl kind of thing. The final girl yeah. kind of moment where she's being chased by the creature. And it's my only major gripe with this movie is that the the kind of adrenaline chase moments that Margot has to go through with the creature it's brought on by computer generated imagery it's cgi and it's very noticeable i mean it was even noticeable to me back in 99 you know 99 when i first watched it i was like that doesn't look good there it looks superimposed it looks like it's not like the effect of it running through the doors as it's chasing her looks yeah. cool honestly when i saw this on tv <clears throat> on vhs i i couldn't tell cgi at the time it, right. it was seamless and of course the film was really really dark yeah but yeah. the fact that the film's now on on dvd and now on blu-ray and, and now they've you know the pictures are much cleaner mm. it's not there's not so much film grain or anything so I think now it's really noticeable. Yeah. But I also think that for the CGI for late 90s, it's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. It's, it's not, not bad. It's not horrible. I'm not saying it's the worst. What mm. I'm saying is, is that especially when she starts coating it with the liquid, I mean, because she just starts oh, smashing it. The up. moment it's on fire. And then though, the moment it's on fire. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not holding up at all well. Yeah, when it's on fire, it's not great. But for late 90s, you know, pre-Matrix... It's not bad. You could see what they were trying. And and I suppose if I'm trying to compare it to the practical effects that I've seen, that yeah, the, the fire effects on the CGI creature doesn't hold up. Now, I think it was because it was also the bit that I mentioned earlier in the video that it was kind of rushed and added at the end. Yes. Uh, because original test audiences didn't like the ending. So they were like, well, we need to blow the creature up at the end for a big hurrah. Yeah. So, it, that's why I feel like maybe it, it, it didn't look right, because they had to rush it. I mean, what was the original ending? Do we know? Did it kill everybody? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would have been cool. But yeah, Margot gets the creature to chase her, and then she jumps in this huge tank of liquid water thing that had been explained earlier in the movie, but I'd completely forgotten. Um, <laughs> and the creature's trying to get her, but then the room just absolutely explodes. The slowest fireball ever in the background. I mean, the creature's moving four times faster <laughs> yeah. than the explosion but that's behind it, but it's fine. Like, it could have just ran down into the sewers and jumped in some yeah. water. I'm sure it would have survived for a little while, but... Then the really Gustav's said killer. flying backwards as well, isn't he? And, yeah. Uh, but he gets in, he gets to open up the lid, and they both have that smile at each other. Yeah. Um, hey, you know what? I'm kind of glad... That the film didn't like force in like a let's become lovers N yeah. during the course of the movie. They they have a little smile at the end, which suggests that maybe they'll talk after the film. Yeah, they might you share know? a coffee. Yeah, That'd exactly. Be nice. yeah, but also, it wasn't forced in, so I, I kind of like that. I but I mean, there was a moment worth talking about though before the creature uh, explodes. Yeah, is when it pins her into a corner essentially and she's waiting for the elevator a bit like aliens oh yes yes and yes. uh and the creature stops right in front of her and again they have that look of recognition and then the creature gets a little bit personal mm, yeah it wanted to lick her and i'm like what would, what was the two of them's relationship before he went off to brazil yeah maybe they had kind of relations i, I but don't know he was but so was... wrapped up in his work the movie doesn't explain it it doesn't know but it, it definitely had its a moment there yeah to suggest definitely it. and again i just think the creature head is fantastic but the cgi tongue not so much <laughs> but uh i would still say it's a very uh satisfying ending uh, yeah. to the film and i think what i like is that it it kind of plays it straight it's not it's not cheesy. No. It's not a cheesy monster movie. I mean, I also like the bit where, like he, like you said, the mayor had told Augusta on the phone, the, the girl is going ahead and we're going to be happy that you're here. And so then later on when everything's kicking off, it's Augusta's turn to, to call the mayor and be like, you listen to me. I'm telling you right now what we're doing. You're going to follow my partner and he's going to get you out. And so after that, when the mayor has gotten out, 
the 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 police chief's like, you wait until I get hold of D'Augusta, I'm going to... He's going to be back in a cop car in no time. Yeah, he's going to, you know, rue the day he crossed me. And the mayor's just like, no, you will not. You know, he got us out. You're going to leave him alone. And so by the end of the movie, I'm actually really satisfied. The creature's dead. D'Augusta might or might not have a thing with Margo. Nobody's holding it against him. And the, ple- the, the, the people of Chicago will never know that this creature was running around. And uh, Linda Hunt uh, probably changed her career now into fashion, I'd imagine. Yes. And the museum business probably not working out too much. She might fly off to a desert planet <laughs> somewhere. It's true. <laughs> Yeah, what were your favourite scenes from The Relic? Um, Well, I've got to go with the easy stuff, which is kind of all the gore effects. You know, like I said, you don't really see the creature in a lot of the kills, but it works for this movie. It's shocking. You know, the fact that when you see the guard sat on the toilet smoking a joint and then all of a sudden this hand comes underneath the stool and pulls him underneath, I'm like... Did, did, did the creature kind of lean down and go, oh yeah, there he is. I, I'm going to grab him. Could it smell him? Could it hear him? Who knows? I mean, the SWAT team attack is just absolutely you know, memorable just watching them. It reminds me of Alligator, you know, when the alligator swam around and it's attacking all those people. God damn love that movie. But that guy being pulled up, he's missing his legs. As I said, the only gripe I have is that CGI bit at the end. But... I've, I've had all this fun leading up to that, just watching it kill people left and right. I do like Tom Sizemore. Some of the sequences that he has, like the penny. I always, whenever I see a coin on the floor, I kind of stop for a moment remembering what he says. And then I remember what Margot says, where she's like, every penny counts. And so <laughs> I'll take that money. Those are some of my just fun ones. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the creature is fantastic. I love the Cathoga. I think its design is great. I think it looks great in the film, the way that it moves, the way that it's animated. The the practical and the CGI, I do like it. I mean, it's it's a bit obvious in CGI in, pl- in parts, but I still do like the design. Yeah. Uh, one of my favourite laugh-out-loud moments in this film, though, is during the lockdown sequence, when I'm past my... Uh, the shock of remembering aliens uh it's when all the security doors are going down and yeah. the other the other cop just grabs this wooden chair and he slide jumps and he slides across the water to get to the door and the the, the, the door just smashes through his chair and he's just like ah oh. like, it was just it was such a heroic moment it was just yeah. so uh, much of an epic fail but i was kind of glad that guy made it out there yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually really enjoyed that entire sequence uh, when the uh, when the body gets the police officer body gets dropped down in the pandemonium and yeah. the, in the carnage. I mean, I think more people do more harm to themselves than we see yeah. the monster do to them throughout the whole movie. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the whole scale of everything was was really really cool. Yeah, uh, I also really liked the the sequence in the in the tunnels with the sniffer dogs trying to track down the creature. I thought yeah. that that was pretty effective. I liked the lighting. The cinematography is good. Now, I, I mean, I will complain about the lighting, that the film is a little bit too dark. Yeah. Uh, now, granted, today the film looks a lot better than I remember, which is good. But there's still a lot of, I mean, there's like three or four shots in daylight in the entire film. Yeah. And the rest is in these sewers where the lights are out. Yeah. Uh, and But even when scenes that don't need to be dark just feel unnecessarily dark. Maybe it's to keep the film tonally the same. Yeah, but yeah it, it, it is distracting. It's noticeable. It's it's not Alien vs. Predator Requiem levels, but no. it's noticeable. Yeah. Uh, worth mentioning. And if I was going to go with one last favourite scene, it's going to be that, that security guard that gets his legs bitten off off yeah. screen and they pull up his torso. I think that reveal is great. And the actor as well, his expression sells it. Like, yeah. you, you see him alive and he is just gone. He's just it, gone. It's, it's, a, it's a great, great moment in the film. Yeah. Ian, do you recommend The Relic? I do. I mean, I... <sighs> I do love revisiting this movie every now and again. I think it's just a classic creature feature. And I mean, I might be putting my head on the block here, but I I think in about 10, maybe 15 years time, when people look back at this movie, it'll be remembered fondly like we do with classic 50s and 60s monster movies from back then, you know, like The Fly or The Blob and things like that. People are like, oh, how is that scary? And then you sit down, you've got your popcorn, you've got it dark, and the movie just kind of sucks you in. Yeah, unfortunately, you don't see the creature a lot, but it does work in this movie's favor, just like it does with Jaws, that when the creature does appear, you're like, oh, fuck, put it away, put it away, you know? You've got plenty of gore and plenty of body parts. The film doesn't seem to shy away from just going, hey, look, this is what it did. Do you like that? Right, wait until the creature turns up in 
45 to 50 minutes, you know? Um, there's not too much major character development with the main leads, but there's just enough to kind of just make you relate a little bit to them. Like with Tom Sizemore's character, he's very superstitious. He's going through some shit. And so he needs this win. You know, he needs to, you know, solve this crime so that he can get back on top. And so his ex-wife will be like, oh, you bastard, you're famous now. Penelope Ann Miller, yeah, she's not the greatest actress, but she sells this kind of scientist, evolutionary expert just enough that she fills in the gaps for Tom Sizemore's character so that by the end, the two of them are like, hey, we need to do this to do this to kill the creature. Let's do it. And it works. Love it. Oh, yeah. I'm also going to be recommending The Relic. This one is definitely worth a watch. It's a well above average creature feature with good performances, good effects, and memorable horror moments. Tom Sizemore and Penelope Ann Miller were, were both great. They're very likable and they're easy to root for, along with a strong support cast, including Linda Hunt and James Whitmore. The creature itself is worth watching for, though it's only in it for about four minutes of the 100 minute <laughs> runtime. Uh, but it's, and, it, and when you do see it, it's mostly obscured in shadow and sometimes in uh, aging CGI. But other than that, it's great. <laughs> it's a really hideous design with lots of cool details that make it stand out. The on-screen kills were also brutal, fairly gory in parts, and there's a fair few scenes of great carnage. My biggest complaint about the film, as I've said, is the lighting. You know, it was intentional by the cinematographer director to light it, looking as natural as possible with lots of shadow, and it's effective. But so much of the picture is lost in blackness and it's hard to see. Uh, even well-lit areas remain mostly in darkness. The music by John Debney was... It was all right. Mm. You know, it didn't stand out. Yeah. But it didn't distract either. So it was serviceable, except when it kind of gave the nostalgia of, again, watching Aliens or Jurassic Park, <laughs> which the film was very likely influenced from. So... Yeah, I, I think the film is worth a watch. I enjoy this one. I think it's one of the, the great monster creature features that, that holds up well. I think a cult classic, if I do dare say. Oh, yes. The next Evolution in Terror. Thanks for watching Off the Shelf Reviews.